Welcome to this program on collision theory. It's collision theory that we use to explain or understand how rates of reaction can be modified. In order for a reaction to occur, the first thing must happen is the molecules must collide. Bimolecular or two-body collisions are by far the most frequent type of collision. This collision has to have two features to be deemed successful. One is it must have su sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy. And secondly, the collision must be at the right angle or have the correct orientation. Let's start by taking a little bit more close look at how activation energy can be represented. Here I have an enthalpy level diagram with energy or enthalpy on one side and the progress of the reaction. We learned in our previous unit that this particular reaction would be one where we lose energy, an exothermic reaction. So that's how we measure the enthalpy change. We can also get from this reaction this term, the activation energy, the minimum energy needed for a successful collision. If I take my reactants here and I look at this height from this point up to here, this represents my activation energy, at least for the forward reaction. So molecules, whatever's colliding, must exceed this amount of energy to have the potential to be a successful collision. If I was to consider the reverse reaction, I'll do this one in red, I would need more activation energy in order for a successful collision to occur. So that would be the activation energy for my reverse reaction. So that's one way we can get a measure of the activation energy. We can also get it from something called a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution graph. So let's take a look at the features, at least, of that graph. On the axis, we have the fraction of particles that have a particular kinetic energy. And on the bottom axis, we have the kinetic energy itself. Now, this graph is derived by studying a group of molecules and taking measurements of their speed or kinetic energy. I'm going to use an analogy here a bit to explain how this can be done. Consider, if you will, a test, perhaps an IV chemistry. And here you can see the scores on that test. The bottom axis, the score, is very similar to what we view down here in this lower graph as kinetic energy. The axis that's on this side, oops, see if I can locate it. The axis over here on this side, this corresponds to the fraction of the class that obtained a particular score, in much the way that we have a fraction of particles with a certain amount of kinetic energy. So this distribution graph is giving me some indication of how much kinetic energy certain fractions of the molecules within this substance has. Now, let's look at where we find activation energy. Over here in green, my activation energy was about three and a half blocks long. So if we start here and we measure about three and a half blocks, there. That could be a measure of the activation energy from here over to here. That mirrors the activation energy I see here. So what it's saying is that within my sample of gas, if I continue this line up, I can sort of divide my graph now into two areas. Molecules over on this side are greater than the activation energy. These have the potential to react, provided they're hitting it at the right geometry or have the correct angle. The molecules over on this side, they don't have sufficient energy. They're not going to react. So just to recap, we can get activation energy from our energy level diagram, which we, we saw in the previous unit. And we can also see activation energy by studying a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution graph. So remember these points as we go forward and look at factors that affect the rate of a reaction, that in order to be successful, you must have enough energy to exceed the activation energy and the molecules must strike at the correct orientation. Thanks for watching.